Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is the umbrella bear, how protecting bears protects ecosystems. And it will be presented by our fabulous NatHab expedition leader, Eddie Savage. Eddie, thank you so much for being here today. This looks like a very interesting topic. Let's dive in. Well, thank you very much, Sunny, and hello, everybody. It's great to be back presenting with you again. Um, yeah, today my topic is the umbrella bear, and the umbrella bear, we'll get into the details of what exactly makes an umbrella bear or an umbrella species in a little bit, but um, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll, let me just introduce myself here. So my name is Eddie Savage. I've been an expedition leader with Natural Habitat Adventures since 2016. Uh, working in a variety of bear-related places over the years, uh, in particular uh, Churchill, Manitoba for polar bears, as well as China on their wild side of China expedition for uh, for giant pandas and heading into giant panda habitat as well. But um, one of my one of th this picture of me was taken in the Great Bear Rainforest on a suitably rainy day. But um, something that uh, you know, when it comes to umbrella species and the umbrella bear in general. I just want you to know that I'm extremely biased towards bears and extremely biased towards this one species. But they are they are legitimately representative of umbrella species. It's just uh, today we'll talk about bears versus all of the other umbrella species, which there are many of, but uh, bears in particular. So today's presentation, what is an umbrella species? We're going to go over that. We're going to go over a couple of other kind of uh, labels that we put on species that are are good protectors of habitat and they're their region. Uh, and the three species of bears that I'm going to go over today uh, will be polar bears, grizzly bears, and giant pandas. And I will kind of touch on uh, a few key points about, you know, what they're doing in their habitat, what areas, uh, what protection they can offer by protecting them, and then also kind of like a case study of an, a, a singular place around the world where uh, there has been or have been protections put in place for uh, the bear, the, the bear species specifically, that has then resulted in extensive protection for hundreds, if not thousands, of other species. So uh, we'll go there and then kind of looking towards the future, we'll talk about conservation considerations with that as well. So I love this map of the world. Um, we've got uh, all eight species of bears. Take a picture of this if you want to remember the eight different species of bears. But um, you can see just by the color coded map of Earth that in particular in the Northern Hemisphere, um, you know, this is just a present day range. Historically, the, the a bear's range was much, much larger than this, encompassing most of Europe and Asia, um, as well as all of, pretty much all of North America, the United States and Canada. Um, but you can see that, that the range is quite extensive. And, you know, as far as kind of a singular species that covers as much of the surface area or kind of like the just bear species, bears in general, uh, one family of animals that covers as much um, kind of surface area, there's not not quite as many. And as well, because they're they're top of the food chain or kind of towards the top, they, they're they they're quite recognizable. And we'll kind of talk about that in a little bit, but I love this, just I'll, I'll kind of refer back to this range map uh, throughout the presentation. So, Let's talk about uh, kind of with the umbrella species, all these three topics that, that I'm going to talk about all kind of fit into the same realm of umbrella species. Umbrella species are usually also uh, surrogate species. So all encompassing of umbrella, focal, keystone indicator and flagship species. Um, a quote from, uh, I think this is the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, from the states is surrogate species is a commonly used scientific term for system-based conservation planning that uses a species as an indicator of landscape habitat and system conditions surrogate species are used for comprehensive conservation planning that supports multiple species and habitats within a defined landscape or geographic area so that's that's pretty good and but something that it often refers back to which doesn't always apply to to bears within their habitat is kind of how important they are um, to kind of balancing an ecosystem. This kind of refers to them being very, very important to balancing an ecosystem, but not all bears uh, throughout their range do the same amount. Of course, of course, within any ecosystem, you want to have a, a good balance of carnivores um, or carnivores are top of the food chain animals, such as bears. 
but uh, yeah, it doesn't always apply to, to every single habitat. But bears are surrogate species. As keystone species, this one is, is very important to refer to because it helps define the ecosystem and it helps, or it is critical to the ecosystem. So bears are oftentimes critical to the ecosystem. Without them, uh, bears can be thrown out of balance, or not bears can be thrown out of balance, but ecosystems, population numbers of, of animals below them in particular, if they are preying on a lot of different species can be thrown out of balance. Um, and that also goes for in, in areas where bears are herbivorous and digging up roots and plants and that kind of stuff. They are kind of ecosystem engineers in a way where they, they are tilling the land and providing kind of new ample habitat for other species to move in. So a nice little uh, quotation here for this, keystone species have low functional redundancy. This means that if the species were to disappear from the ecosystem, no other species would be able to fill its ecological niche. The ecosystem would be forced to radically change, allowing new and possibly invasive species to populate the habitat. Now, this can happen in some, in some senses with bears, not, but it's not always the case. And bears as flagship species. This is absolutely true of some species of bears, but not all species of bears. So when we look at this beautiful giant panda that's having a nap on a log here, um, we look at probably one of the most recognizable um, bears or animals on this planet. You take the picture of a giant panda, um, anywhere around the world show it up, people say panda, you know, almost guaranteed no matter where you are. It's incredibly recognizable. The human eye is very attracted to those black ears, those black eyes, that black nose, those black shoulders. It's just simple contrast and it's an incredibly recognizable animal. Um, Flagship species are often ambassadors for certain regions for, or you know, within their habitat. They're iconic, um, they're, they're looked up to, they're, they're uh, fawned over. Um, and as I say here, they become a symbol of that habitat or a symbol of a part of the world or symbol of conservation in that sense. And they become the face of a campaign. If we think about giant pandas in regard to conservation of wild spaces in China, um, there's not a lot of media about that that makes it over to uh, North America, um, but there is quite a lot. But we see giant pandas in our zoos um, in North America and Europe. Um, we see we see these animals kind of all around the world, and we recognize it. And then also, you know, we're looking at the WWF here, where even though, for example, WWF US has no giant pandas within kind of their range globally. We recognize that and we recognize the panda as a symbol of conservation. So that's a really great example of bears as a flagship species. Another example might be um, polar bears and the Arctic and, and climate change. They've become a bit of a flagship species for that. So when I talk about umbrella species, and I talk about the umbrella bear in particular, um, Essentially, by protecting one species, you don't only protect that, that singular species, you also protect everything kind of underneath its umbrella within its habitat. Um, hundreds, if not thousands of species will benefit from that and critical habitat will be protected just the same. So um, umbrella species are usually uh, either a flagship or keystone species or both. Um, and basically, yeah, it, an umbrella species is defined as a species whose conservation is expected to confer protection to a large number of naturally co-occurring species. So other examples, of course, this, this lovely image from treehugger, um, I think treehugger.org um, kind of gives us an idea of some different umbrella species. They don't always have to be large charismatic species. They just have to be kind of, you know, recognizable and important enough and in and, 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 and reasonable enough shape that they need protection. Um, and with that, you're protecting much more. So examples, red wolf, coho salmon, giant panda, of course. I liked it on this. There's already three different bears, um, spotted owls. I know there's some critically endangered habitat for spotted owls within like these old growth inland rainforests in British Columbia. Um, right whales, oftentimes whales in general, uh, not just right whales. Um, here on the west coast, we have orcas, uh, the southern resident killer whales in particular. Um, and then even butterflies um, can can kind of make or break or, or can be con considered an umbrella species. By protecting them, you protect so much more. 
But let's get into um, a bit of a case study here with the polar bear. So the polar bear, Ursus maritimus, the largest of the bears on average weight. Um, it resides, of course, up in the north in the Arctic. Its habitat is sea ice. It's where it makes its living is on the sea ice. Uh, there's 22 to 33 or 31,000, 22,000 to 31,000 polar bears um, on Earth. In a number of their ranges, their populations are threatened. They are definitely flagship species when it comes to the Arctic. They've become kind of an icon of the Arctic. Whenever you think about polar bear, you think about sea ice, you think about climate change. Whenever you think about climate change, you think about polar bears and vice versa. It kind of has become synonymous with the Arctic. In, in reality, um, you know, there's 22 to 31,000 polar bears, but there's so many other species um, on the sea ice. So let's talk about where they are, where they sit within that ecosystem. So they are top of the food chain. Um, they're 99% carnivorous. Their main food source is ring seals, um, which makes up that 99%. Um, in their habitat, they absolutely 100% rely on sea ice. That's what they need to make a living. Um, bears in the Western Hudson Bay and Churchill region where Natural Habitat Adventures does their polar bear, uh, polar bear expeditions. Um, those bears spend time on land in the summertime and through the fall, but they're not really eating very much. Um, there's not a lot to eat. And when it comes to their size, um, there's not a lot of opportunity to, to you know, there's, there's one of my favorite, the favorite things I've read is about polar bears, um, basically an average size polar bear. If it wants to catch a snow goose to eat, it has 11 seconds that it can chase that snow goose. Otherwise it's burnt more energy than it will get from, you know, a nice 12 to 15 pound snow goose. Um, because of their size, they require really high fat, high protein food sources to the tune of, you know, preferably 100 to 150 pounds in the form of a ring seal per meal, not in kind of a chase that requires uh, a lot of energy to catch a snow goose because they will lose energy by, by doing that. So anyways, they rely on food sources that are on the sea ice and they're only able to get that for about six months of the year during the winter and early spring months. Um, so sea ice is critical to their survival. They are an obvious indicator species, as we talked about uh, a little bit before. So they're indicators of what's happening within their environment. Um, if polar bears are starting to see population drops, um, population decline in certain regions, then we're also starting to uh, recognize that there's something amiss with the sea ice, probably with their, their hunting platform, um, but also with the food chain, if they're not able to, to maintain a population, let alone grow a population comes down to food availability, habitat access, but they're incredibly intertwined with bears or polar bears um, because the sea ice needs to be a stable platform for them to hunt. Um, if it's not a stable platform, it's fine for seals, but it's not good for bears. Um, and it basically is signaling that there will be uh, some potential population collapses in the future. Um, so anyways, moving on with that. Under the umbrella of the polar bear, um, most importantly, as discussed, is sea ice. So sea ice is important to the bears, but sea ice in general is important to global climate. Um, it's important to millions and millions of, of individual animals. Um, it is the foundation of the Arctic food chain. So the way that, that nutrients, the way that, that plankton or algae is formed in the Arctic um, is you have sea ice basically overlaying the ocean and then the sun shines through. The average depth is about two meters. Light can still get through. Um, and then algae begins to form and grow on the bottom of the sea ice. And that algae is basically the foundation uh, moving through plankton, phytoplankton, zooplankton, um, invertebrates, et cetera, to small fish, eventually seals to polar bears. And so everything relies on kind of this, this boon that occurs when there's sea ice and sunshine uh, creating this this algae um, for animals to eat. And so when you don't have sea ice, um, everything suffers, um, including the bears. So everything kind of dwindles away. Um, so by, by protecting a polar bear, you will have to protect the sea ice. You have to, you know, essentially curb global climate change in a sense. Um, but by protecting polar bear habitat um, and creating 
conservation areas surrounding polar bear habitats. When we talk about kind of marine animals that will that will survive or, or thrive uh, with the protection that, that polar bears would get, uh, we're talking about all of the Arctic whales, bowhead whales, beluga whales, and narwhals, walrus, uh, ring seals, bearded seals, many other different species of seals, um, hundreds of species of fish, thousands of species of invertebrates, um, as well as even right down to the algae that grows on the sea ice, uh, which could be in danger if there's no sea ice for it. When it comes down to terrestrial, so because bear, bears around much of the Arctic, but definitely in the Churchill region, spend part of their year on land waiting for the sea ice to form again, um, a lot of bears, polar bears also den on land. And so in areas where you have den sites, which are critical, of course, to the reproduction of polar bears and the growing of these little little polar bear cubs the next generation, um, in areas where you can protect dens in these resting areas for the summertime on land, um, you get uh, you get protection also for kind of larger charismatic animals like caribou, wolves, foxes, hares, um, wolverines, lemmings, mink, marten, uh, migratory birds to the tune of millions upon millions of migratory birds across the tundra in the north. Um, as well as other bears, black bears and grizzly bears, um, and thousands of species of plants, vascular plants, lichens, mosses, trees, etc. You are protecting a very important habitat. As well, if you can kind of, if you can protect tundra habitat, um, tundra, some of you folks have may have, have heard about kind of like the feedback loop that goes with melting permafrost and, and kind of this organic matter that's been frozen in the permafrost and the microbes um, that have been frozen in the permafrost thawing and then becoming available, perma permafrost being permanently frozen ground when it melts and just becomes uh, ground. Um, basically, it's then able to decompose, releasing methane, which then goes into the upper, goes into the atmosphere, warming our planet a little bit more, melting more permafrost, releasing more methane, and that's the feedback loop. That, that cycles to uh, kind of increase more methane coming from uh, melting permafrost in the Arctic. So if you can protect the polar bear, you protect the sea ice, and you can also protect um, habitat uh, for them on land, which protects, protects tundra. All right, so let's talk about that in action. Uh, we're going to go to Churchill. And so I'm just gonna grab my little laser pointer here. And maybe you can see the little red dot. I hope you can. So Churchill is kind of where the red dot is right now. And sliding it over there, you can kind of see I'm circling this area in between Churchill and Cape Churchill. It may be a little bit small to read, but I'm circling this area. This is where we do our polar bear viewing um, right here. And then this large outlined green area here is what is called Wapusk National Park. We do our viewing in the Churchill Wildlife Management Area, which is a buffer zone to the national park. And Wapusk National Park, folks, is by no means uh, a Yellowstone or, or you know, one of those easily accessible parks that you can drive into. This is one of the most difficult to access parks. It only has about 100 visitors per year, accessing it mostly by helicopter. Um, in the winter time, you may get a few uh, researchers or, uh, you, yeah, usually researchers going in and, and checking on equipment through the winter on snowmobile but it's, it's inaccessible. And that's really good because within Wapusk National Park, um, it was basically, Wapusk is, means polar bear, basically, or white bear. Um, and, uh, and basically, so white bear national park in a sense. And you've got, you, you have um, protection for thousands of polar bear maternity dens. So all throughout that, that region, um, all throughout, the, the national park, um, you have den sites, some of them which have been used um, periodically for over 200 years. Uh, some of them are, are being freshly dug, but you have kind of these things called peat mounds where um, over a year, over hundreds, if not thousands of years of kind of the, the, the grow freeze cycle. So growing in the summertime, uh, everything dies throughout the winter, the, the plant matter Kind of falls to the ground but because it doesn't have very long in the summertime to decompose it just freezes and kind of stacks up stacks up stacked up stacks up um, this is that it, it's peat mounds is what they're called and they just kind of accumulate and accumulate and then within Wapos National Park there's some regions where you get like three to five meter high mounds of 
of peat forming up around kind of the edges of lakes and rivers um, and, and river banks and stuff like that. And then on top of that, you get trees growing on it and then the bears can excavate underneath those to create uh, maternity dens. So that's why Wapus National Park was, was created, was to protect the maternity den sites of the polar bear. And on the Parks Canada website, it says this, this 11,475 square kilometer park at the tr transition between boreal forest and Arctic tundra protects one of the largest polar bear maternity denning areas in the world. That's the quote from the website. It does not mention anything about the over 200 species of birds that migrate and nest there, the caribou herd that, that kind of lives or uses the Wapus National Park for calving. Um, it doesn't really mention the, the kind of rare southerly Arctic ecosystem where you do have that transition. It doesn't mention the Arctic foxes or the wolves or any other fur-bearing animals. Um, it doesn't mention kind of these rare plants and unique, new, unique kind of plant life and, and uh, an ecosystem that thrives there um, because it was set up for polar bears. And that it's a fantastic example of um, an umbrella species or an umbrella bear at work. Because the bear's den here, everything else is protected. Really cool. All right, so moving on, brown bears, grizzly bears, Ursus arctos, Urctus arctos horribilis. Uh, we're just gonna call them brown bears for today. Um, kind of all encompassing and more of a global term. But uh, let's talk about where the brown bears are found. So brown bears have an extensive range in North America. The population is somewhere between, you know, 35 and 50,000. Globally, somewhere around 100,000 uh, brown bears. And then if you look at that range, much of Russia, uh, areas of, uh, of China, Tibet, uh, within the Himalayas, there's kind of uh, the Himalayan brown bears. There's also European brown bears. There's uh, they, they have quite an extensive range and they're ex extremely adaptable. They are the most widely distributed bear species. And so there's a really great opportunity there to, of course, if you're protecting habitat for one of the most widely distributed bears, you're going to protect a lot of different things. But their habitat includes coastal habitat, a very like marine environment where they're, you know, on the coast of British Columbia or on the coast of Alaska, where they're spending a lot of time feeding on salmon and all that good stuff. Um, but they're also found inland. They feed on a wide variety of foods. I think even coastal bears eat over a hundred different types of plants. Um, and then interior bears, and they, they probably have thousands of species of plants that they, they eat, uh, plants, berries, et cetera, um, that they eat throughout the world. Um, but they can be found kind of coastal habitat, inland, uh, mountains, plains, low Arctic, alpine environment. Um, they are extremely adaptable and can thrive pretty much anywhere. The only reason why um, kind of they've been extirpated from much of their range is because be grizzly bears, or sorry, brown bears, grizzly bears, um, they are perceived um, to be more dangerous and they are perceived to be more aggressive. And so wherever a brown bear ends up, uh, usually people don't let that brown bear stick around very long um, and they'll be pushed out of their habitat. It's just, a, it's kind of a, a a better understanding that's needed about brown bears and their behavior um, globally um, for us to kind of coexist with them a little more smoothly. Anyhow, so there's an amazing opportunity for protection because of that that wide range. Um, yeah, so let's talk about their ecosystem position. So in some of their habitats, they are top of the food chain, not carnivores, but omnivores. Um, bears are more carnivorous uh, towards kind of the fall typically. Um, in particular in coastal regions or in areas where there's salmon or some sort of fish they can they can go for or larva. They want kind of that fat and that protein. They have a different program than polar bears. They need to gain a whole bunch of weight in the late fall, of course, to before they head out onto the sea ice or <laughs> whoops, uh, before they head into the den um, to hibernate for the winter. And so they they kind of have a, a big boom time through kind of August, September, October. Um, sometimes a little earlier to gain a whole bunch of weight, somewhere around 40% of their body weight is what they're looking to gain before heading into the den to hibernate for anywhere from four to six months. Um, so they're highly reliant on, on calorie rich food, fat, fat calorie rich food because of that wide ranging diet. If you're going to protect a brown bear, 
um, you need to protect a lot. You need to basically protect an entire habitat. You can't just say, oh, we're only going to take this and this out of this habitat. You need to protect a lot of habitat and keep the region quite pristine um, in order to, to continue to have brown bears in that area. Um, so their food sources, like I was saying, you know, they, they probably have thousands of, of, of different types of plants that they eat globally. Um, but typically in the fall, they're going for fish runs, ungulate migrations, fruit, fruiting, or abundance of fruits, abundance of nuts, um, specific larva uh, being available. Um, but basically they are, they can very much hold their own and other, other animals don't really mess with them within their habitat, even though they're not necessarily uh, actively hunting and chasing deer or, or actively hunting and chasing elk and moose in some parts of their range. Sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. Um, the other animals just kind of steer clear of them because they are, they are big and they are uh, confident uh, owners of their domain. So under the brown bear umbrella, um, if we kind of talk about the food source that they need, of course we need to protect you know, somewhere to the tune of, of 20 to 40,000 calories a day um, during those kind of fall months so they can gain a whole bunch of weight to go into the den. Um, and with dens, we also need to protect old growth forests um, or kind of areas where they have, we need to basically protect areas where we're not gonna have a lot of disturbance through the winter time um, because where bears are denning, if you're going in and, you know, riding around on snowmobiles or, um, you know, hiking through, bringing, bringing heavy machinery through industrial activities, um, you're going to be disturbing those bears. And, and in many parts of British Columbia, um, they do need kind of larger, older trees. They need those big, sturdy root bases to excavate their dens underneath. And so we need to protect old growth forests. Um, also for a lot of bear species, in particular on the west coast of North America, we're protecting salmon spawning rivers. And salmon themselves are an indicator species and a keystone species. Um, they're not as charismatic and they don't really hit the flagship species usually. It's harder to get people to spend a whole bunch of money on a, a picture of a fish versus a picture of a cute uh, grizzly or brown bear cub. Um, so you need to protect those salmon spawning rivers under the umbrella and you need to protect the alpine um, and, and where they're denning and all that kind of stuff. So Essentially, by protecting a brown bear, you are protecting thousands and thousands of species of plants. You're protecting, you're protecting basically, it's, a, it's almost like a third of the world. Um, you would have to protect by protecting the brown bear. Um, and when you protect environment or habitat for brown bears, um, you have to protect everything all the way from the ocean, the river, the trees, the land, the mountains, and everything. And so it's, it's quite, uh, quite consistent quite good if you can protect land for or protect habitat for brown bears. So let's go for the umbrella bear in action and we are going to talk about the Great Bear Rainforest. This clever name, the Great Bear Rainforest, um, and this is this is somewhere where, where Nathab actually does a fantastic trip um, right into the heart of the Great Bear Rainforest. You, you know, not just for grizzly bears or brown bears, but for um, for spirit bears, uh, which also rely or live in the Great Bear Rainforest. But this area here, um, it got the name the Great Bear Rainforest because it is one of the largest tracts of mostly intact coastal temperate rainforest anywhere on earth. Um, from the, basically like from the ocean all the way to the mountaintops, um, about, I think it's about 60% of this area. And we're talking you know, the, the, the span is about 200 miles. I think it's about 50,000 square kilometers, a, quite a large region, um, which has thousands and thousands of salmon bearing rivers, got, has a lot of old growth forest, has a lot of second growth forest as well. Um, but any industrial activity is, is very carefully managed and very, um, it, it's consulted with um, by, the, by the government as well as with uh, First Nations, with also ecosystem kind of, considerations before anything happens within the Great Bear Rainforest. Um, so by protecting all the way from the ocean to the mountain tops in this area, you're protecting those salmon, you're protecting the food sources, you're protecting the sedges and the estuaries, you're protecting the old growth trees, you're protecting the den sites, you're protecting everything um, for this bear. And then underneath it, you know, you're not, it's called the Great Bear Rainforest, but what about like the coastal wolves? that thrive here? What about the humpback whales that feed in the fjords 
Um, what about the seals and the sea lions, um, the, all the black bears, spirit bears? Um, they kind of fall within that great bear term. Um, what about all those species of salmon, um, the, the river otters, the minks, the martens, the, the deer, the elk, the everything. It's migratory birds as well. Um, just so, so much is protected. And, you know, if we were to call this like the great Martin rainforest, I don't think it would have the same curb appeal. You know, there'd it'd be less likely to attract a lot of attention and less likely to, to bring people in to see it um, and want to kind of put effort into protect it. So by using great bear, let's, you know, the brown bear, um, we've been able to kind of attract a lot of eyes and attract a lot of um, donation money, um, British Columbia in general, to uh, to protecting this area. And the government as well is, the government of British Columbia um, is keen on on protecting this, as well as are all the stakeholders, the, the, the many First Nations groups that, um, whose traditional territory, the Great Bear Rainforest is as well. They are, they are very much in support of protecting this, this region as well. So that's the Great Bear Rainforest. And last but not least, we're gonna talk about the giant panda. Isla Rapota Melana Lueca, somewhere around there. Anyways, so the giant panda, this one here, it's on my shirt. Um, it's on most of my hats. It's on my water bottle, of course. Well, I mean, WWF. But um, it is definitely one of the most recognized animals on this planet. Um, but what's really interesting about that is there's less of these bears than there are of any other species of bears. And its global fame has a lot to do with the way that it looks and the way that it's perceived by people. There's something about this bear in the eyes and the ears and the face and perhaps kind of their roly poly kind of very relaxed kind of demeanor when they're feeding um, that, that humans really draw a great connection to. And you may have heard of like the, the pandemonium, um, you know, people around the world, there's like live webcams on giant pandas in, in uh, breeding and research facilities. Um, in in China, as well as, you know, if they ever end up at like the San Diego Zoo or the Washington Zoo or or something like that, uh, where there, there might be like breeding, there's, you know, people are, people all around the world are like celebrating um, giant pandas birthdays there. It's like people love giant pandas. And so that's where they really fit into to this. Their range, as you can see on this map, is incredibly small. And that range as well is also just having seen kind of the exact ranges and how um, disconnected they are in China um, on, on much more detailed maps. That is even an exaggeration on how large the giant pandas range is. Um, as far as population goes, there's about 1,860 something um, in the wild as for the last count that I've read about. Um, and then in captivity, there's somewhere around 450. So we're talking about 2,250 bears, um, maybe 2,300 uh, giant pandas in the entire planet. As far as donation money and conservation dollars going towards giant pandas, it's got to be to the tune of a billion or more um, for this one specific species. It's really captured the the heart and the minds of the world, um, the giant panda. So where does it fit in with its ecosystem position? It is not the top of the food chain. This bear, its diet is 99% bamboo. Um, and it's, it's super, super niche. It sits there, it eats bamboo for somewhere to 14, eight, 14 to 18 hours a day, and then sleeps the rest and then wakes up and eats more bamboo repeat. It, it does that. It doesn't have kind of the boom bust cycle that polar bears and brown bears have. It's, it doesn't hibernate. Um, it basically just eats bamboo. And so when we're looking at its ecosystem position and what it needs is it doesn't need other species, really. It doesn't really need, you know, a lot of tacken or wolves or salmon or anything like that. It just needs 
a vast tract of bamboo and you know some good old valleys that have lots and lots of bamboo growing in it as well as some old growth trees for uh, for denning so they do kind of go into a den a little bit of a birth layer um, they might crawl up into a tree they need trees um, to, to climb up and and have naps this is more of an adaptation to a time when there were predators within their ecosystem um, there's not as many today. There used to be clouded leopards that overlapped with a lot of giant panda habitat as well as tigers in some of their habitats. So they they were kind of at risk then, but so they still nap in trees for that reason. Um, but they require vast tracts of bamboo and big old trees and they need connected habitat to find mates. So they're in a kind of a unique situation because China had already really well developed. A lot of roads were built and valleys were being, were, were being farmed kind of well before um, we understood or, or the world understood, China understood that there was only maybe a thousand of them left. This was like back in the 1970s. Um, there was some researchers that went over there with WWF, of course, um, uh, to basically go and, and find out how many giant pandas were, were left and they estimated between like 900 and 1000 in the early 1970s and it basically became like an urgent kind of move to protect uh, giant panda habitat and protect kind of what last um, bits of intact forest and bamboo valleys there were because they were they were quickly being converted into farms nobody knew where how much habitat was left so the remainder of their habitat is only in very mountainous difficult to get to regions that is unfortunately it's frag quite fragmented by the valleys having been farmed um, and so protecting their habitat protecting these these fragmented kind of patches of, of forest is really really important giant pandas are also a little bit uh, worried about um, uh, noise and people and that kind of stuff and they'll usually stay like three or four miles away from a highway um, if they can hear it they don't like the noise so they'll kind of uh, go back away from that, which makes crossing a highway to go find a mate um, very difficult. And they become isolated in these little kind of mountain islands of, of bamboo, where some populations can have like five pandas, um, where the worry would be with five pandas all breeding together and their offspring breeding together, you can have interbreeding and the population will eventually ultimately fizzle out. Um, whereas you can have larger habitats where you've got um, maybe uh, 200 animals in that zone and they're they're not as much of a worry but i think one of the the biggest kind of conservation moves and and that uh, china is trying to do or trying to work towards is what's called kind of the giant panda national park um, where they're going to be connecting it'll be three times the size of yellowstone but they're going to try to connect all of these fragmented habitats or most of these fragmented habitats um, within that protection and then also work towards finding ways to you know, regrow bamboo areas and, and kind of make safe passage for um, for giant pandas um, throughout that range. It's it's a big undertaking, but it's it's no doubt within reach. Um, yeah, but it's definitely the hardest thing to do for giant pandas. So when we look at what's under the giant pandas umbrella, um, we have you know there's there's animals that. It, underneath their umbrella that many people have probably never heard of nor seen. Um, the animal in this image is a golden tacken um, or a Szechuan tacken. Um, it's about 1200 pounds. It's a goat antelope and it uh, feeds on 50 to 80 different species of plants. Um, and within a giant panda nature reserve where there's 50 giant pandas thereabouts, there's over a thousand giant tackens. And there, of these, of these Tackens as well, there's only 12,000 of them left on Earth um, because they share the habitat of the giant panda. There's only about 1,200 or 12,000 of them left on Earth, um, but they don't get the same conservation attention that a giant panda does. Um, another animal is the golden snub nosed monkeys. That's another animal that there's only 10 to 12,000 of on Earth um, that doesn't get the same attention as a giant panda, but it's, it shares the same habitat. And then you have uh, macaques, Tibetan macaques, Reese's macaques, um, Chinese serrao, um, giant salamanders share the same habitat, hundreds and hundreds of little known endangered and endemic species, migratory birds. They all, they all kind of fall underneath the giant panda's umbrella. And that's where I'm gonna take you to the umbrella bear in action, and we're going to go to the Wolong 
uh, nature reserve. And I'm going to read you this directly from, this is a UNESCO World Heritage or a, a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve as well. Um, so this region was protected specifically because the giant pandas, this is one of the last strongholds. There's, 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 there's kind of a connection of, of reserves that has about a third of all giant pandas kind of connected within the same the same close region and Wollong Nature Reserve is one of them and this is one of the first reserves and where some of the first research um, was done on giant pandas back in the 1970s um, and population um, programs they, that was all done kind of in Wollong and it's somewhere where on our giant panda or, or our, our wild side of China trips we also go right through this this road right through the bottom of the the valley and uh, and stop at the giant panda uh, breeding and research base there, which is super, super cool. Um, anyhow, so this is straight from the UNESCO Biosphere uh, Reserve site. Um, quote, the property is an important center of endemism for some bird taxa with 365 bird species recorded, 300 of which breed locally. However, the property is particularly important for flora, being one of the botanically, one of the most botanically rich sites of any temperate region in the world with some 5,000 to 6,000 species recorded. Many species are relics such as the dove tree and there is significant diversity in groups such as magnolias, bamboos, rhododendrons and orchids. The property is a major source and gene pool for hundreds of traditional medicinal plants, many now under threat. So what that says to me is because we like the giant panda and we protected habitat for the giant panda, we've also gone the China has also gone and protected um, one of the most biologically rich or botanically rich sites of any temperate region on earth. Um, so thank you, Giant Panda, for that. And so folks, um, with that, these are just a few of the examples of, of ways that bears are protecting habitat around the world and the stories kind of in particular with, with brown bears in different habitats uh, around North America and the world. Um, polar bears, basically wherever we can protect areas for bears, we're also, also protecting bear areas for thousands and thousands of other species. Um, they're well recognized, they're really fun to look at and photograph um, and learn about, and so let's protect some bears. Anyhow, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you enjoyed this, and you can find me on Instagram or Facebook if you want to see pictures of bears. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. Eddie, thank you. That was fabulous. Um, we've got some great questions to dive into. So we'll start with, um, what has the trend been with polar bear population over the last 20 years or so? Globally. Um, so if we, if we kind of break it down into different areas, um, there ha it, it's, it's changed a little bit. So I wish I had a little a little uh, map that I could put up here with kind of their population zones. If we're looking at the north slope of Alaska and we're looking at um, kind of the Beaufort Sea region, we're looking at a decline of about 25 percent, um, 25 to 50 percent um, in the last uh, 25 years. If we're looking at Churchill, where we do our viewing, um, the population decline uh, since 2016, the the last count in 2016 was somewhere around 850, and now it's in the mid 600s. And so we're seeing a, a significant decline, um, even over eight years um, in the Western Hudson Bay population. Um, there's some regions where bears are going to do a little bit better, and that basically has to do with the type of ice. So polar bears are going to do best where they can find lots of ring seals. Ring seals, basically, they need sea ice to haul out on. Um, to molt their fur, as well as their pups need to be born on sea ice. And so when we're looking at where ring seals are or bearded seals are, um, they're going to be in areas of continental shelf. And so where there's an area of continental shelf and ice that is, you know, kind of in that one to two meter thickness, um, a, a depth that is um, sufficient for, for the seals to kind of either dig a little breathing hole through or can break apart easy, easy enough so that they can have these leads in the ice, these cracks in the ice that they can hop out on and, and, and rest and molt and give birth to pups and that kind of stuff. Um, as long as you have that type of ice, then you're going to have more ring seals. You're gonna have ring seals there. But there's a lot of the, the high Arctic right now that, um, and if we go back 30 or 40 years, 
if we go back to uh, the 70s and 80s, a lot of the high Arctic, it, it had what's called multi-year ice or ice that um, basically it, it doesn't completely freeze or it, it basically stays all the way through the summer months and then it just refreezes again. So it can get quite old. It's it's kind of consistent, um, deep, thick ice that, that doesn't move too much. And when we're thinking about like the Northwest Passage and why ships couldn't transit the Northwest Passage. Um, if you go back 40 years ago, there really wasn't much of a route because there was a lot of multi-year ice that uh, that would kind of jam up these seaways and make it uh, inaccessible or inaccessible. Um, but today, kind of 30, 40 years on from that, we're looking at a warmer Arctic that has uh, uh, basically a really a much smaller summer sea ice extent than it's ever had. Um, and with that, you get these areas of multi-year ice. They're no longer areas of multi-year ice. They're now areas of annual ice. So ice that freezes in the winter time and thaws in the summer, which means areas that had multi-year ice 30 years ago were not really great for seals because they couldn't use that area. The ice was too thick and too stubborn to actually use for their, their, their exact, like their resting, their molting, their, their pupping. Um, but now, because it freezes and thaws, it's a lot thinner, um, it breaks apart easier, and it's more accessible to seals. So there's more food there, which means that bears are not necessarily like traveling there. Well, I guess they would be. They basically, they're, they're kind of moving into this new habitat that was not accessible. Um, so you have populations on the southern fringes, like the Beaufort Sea and the western Hudson Bay and the southern Hudson Bay um, polar bear populations that are going to be declining. Um, whereas moving kind of into the north areas where ice is becoming more useful for seals, you're going to have some populations that will slowly be increasing, but that's only going to increase to a carrying capacity. Um, and then as we kind of move forward in time, another 20, 30, 40 years, that whole sea ice dynamic is going to change as well. So we may see a, another decline um, in those regions as well. There's, there's something that's called the last ice area. Um, I would consider, I would recommend um, doing a quick search on that. I think WWF has some good, uh, some good writing on that. But that's something that's being focused on kind of in the high, high Canadian Arctic um, areas where there's likely to be good sea ice for the longest period of time and will likely be one of the last strongholds for polar bears in 100 years. Hmm. Thank you for explaining that. Welcome. How do how do brown bears in Europe and Asia compare in size and weight with North American brown bears? So if we go to that's a great question. If we go to Alaska and we go to kind of Kodiak Island, um, we go to areas where you have what are dubbed the Kodiak bears or Ursus arctos middendorfi, um, which is debated as to whether or not they're a separate subspecies in a number of categories. But let's just say for this, they are. They have longer claws, they've got bigger heads, and they attain lo the largest kind of average body weight size um, of any brown bear around the world. And so we're looking at like, you know, bears can range from 800 pounds to 1500 pounds to 1800 pounds. Um, I don't know off the top of my head what the heaviest Kodiak or heaviest brown bear in Alaska was, but you'll definitely see areas where, where bears are gorging themselves on salmon. Um, you're going to get kind of the biggest, the biggest bears. The further away you move from kind of those really dense, rich food sources, you get into harsher terrain, harsher climate, and or basically more difficult living and way more difficult living conditions for brown bears, and they have to be a little more scroungier, um, diverse with their diets, um, and you know scavenging and and looking for carry on, uh, carry on, and that kind of stuff. Um, so. If you go inland, even into the Rockies, you're looking at like uh, Rocky Mountains, um, you're looking at like three, 400, 500 pounds for a grizzly bear. Um, and then if you go into areas of like Russia and Asia and Europe, you're probably looking around the same, like 300 to 500 pounds. But the biggest bears are definitely, I'd say West Coast, Northwest Coast, North America. Um, like in British Columbia, where I've done some work, and you know, maybe maybe 200 miles from Vancouver, 250 miles from Vancouver, I've seen a thousand pound uh, brown bear in there. So um, yeah, that's, I hope that answers your question. Absolutely. Um, will polar bears survive by hybridizing 
with brown bears? We are, we're jumping right into it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so hybridizing is something that has uh, hypothetically been happening um, all throughout the history of, of, of brown bears and polar bears. So polar bears basically moved away or polar bears became a separate species around 150 to 500,000 years ago. Um, but basically there has been kind of the, the flow, the gene flow has gone back and forth with, with kind of hybridization along the fringe of their habitat. So it's likely that hybrids have, have existed all throughout history and, or at least what, from what we know, it's likely that it's been happening for the last, since the last ice age, at least, and, and probably prior to that, wherever they overlapped in habitat, it likely happened. Um, but today what we're seeing is in a lot of the kind of southerly regions of, of polar bear habitat, you, where, where brown bears and polar bears, or brown bears, grizzly bears, and polar bears overlap, um, you're having an increased frequency of encounters among the two during a shared breeding time. And so there is a possibility that there will be more um, hybrids to be. Um, will that be kind of the, the savior for the polar bear? I don't know, but you know, if, if we had, if we could fast forward 10,000 years, could brown bears potentially, like if all polar bears disappeared and if we had like, I don't know, another 150 to 500,000 years, could brown bears effectively turn into polar bears again? Probably, um, it just, it's just a matter of having the time to do it. And that's one of the biggest differences right now um, is the rate at which the change is happening. We're seeing kind of rate uh, changes happening in 10 years that normally take hundreds of years to, uh, within, our, within our environment that normally take hundreds of years to happen. So um, it'll, it'll be interesting to see what does happen, but I don't know if the hybridization will ultimately lead to um, this, you know, the saving grace for the, the polar bear. Hmm. Fascinating. Um, we have one more time for one more question and it's not going to be an easy one because this crowd yeah. is pretty <laughs> they're pretty smart and they've got lots of great questions Love um, it. but this one um is about the willow um drilling project in alaska um ah. what impact do you anticipate that having on the polar bears up there in that region and is there anything that we can do to protect that area that is that is really interesting and i something I, that immediately struck me about the willow project when i when i first saw it come up um was and i i'll be honest i haven't i haven't read much more than maybe one or two articles about it um but i can touch on kind of what i have read about with in regards to um uh basically drilling and and seismic kind of what is it when they're seismic exploration when they're looking for oil and gas reserves mm -hmm. um and that kind of stuff so i'll touch on that but the one thing that i got is you know what a what a nice way to try to get public opinion swaying towards in favor by giving it a nice name like willow that just sounds you know oh the willow project sure you know it's like right, <laughs> right next to you know the critical uh polar bear denning habitat in an already declining uh population but it's the Willow Project. It's fine. Um, anyway, so with that, with for, from my reading, what what ends up happening with um, kind of with seismic um, seismic exploration is you have like this machine that I don't I don't know too much about. I was just reading about it, but you have this machine that basically rolls along, and it it basically like smashes the earth and like sends a seismic wave, a very loud wave vibration down into many many you know thousands of yards of a substrate to get an idea of where the, it's basically like sounding for or um, like sonar for for the earth they just but you have to make the sound by hitting the ground really hard and then the, the sound waves bounce back up in different frequencies and it gives you how deep everything is and you can imagine that if there are bears in the den or bears on land in particular maybe pregnant female bears and there's seismic exploration going on um, that can be extremely disrupted to to denning polar bears, um, as well. Just having machinery and people and and that kind of thing within bear habitat, in particular summer bear habitat, 
Another one is if you're going to have kind of like these permanent structures where there's people living and working, um, they need to be extremely well managed as far as um, kind of food availability and, and waste and garbage and all that kind of stuff. They need to be extremely uh, well taken care of and all of that needs to be extremely well managed. Otherwise, you'll have attractants um, for those bears. And bears in general are quite attracted to the smell of um, petroleum products like diesel. I've, I've seen a bear where there was a little bit of a diesel spill and some mud kind of wander on over, sniff the mud and then just go roll around right in the diesel. So um, I would say that kind of any large scale industrial, act, industrial activity um, in a region where there are polar bear den sites um, is, is not great. And something that's actually happening in the Beaufort Sea um, is that's an area where a lot of polar bear dens um, have historically actually been on the sea ice um, because the sea ice conditions. So like if we're coming into October, November, when, when females um, are looking to kind of create a den, settle down for the uh, kind of that two month gestation before giving birth to cubs around the end of December and early January, um, they used to den out on, on the sea ice, but now because we're seeing a decline in sea ice and sea ice stability, more bears are choosing to den inland. So you may have a double whammy here, which is less bears on the sea ice, more bears coming inland looking for den sites, and then potentially um, this, you know, if there's a large amount of industrial activity disturbing or, or kind of moving bears into other areas. So then it, then it becomes kind of a, a carrying capacity issue. It's like, you know, well, there are a bunch of good den sites here, but there's also a whole bunch of activity. So bears probably aren't going to stick around there. They're going to go somewhere else, but there's already other bears there. So I don't know. I, I don't know too much about it. I just I can just see that if there's a lot of that drilling and stuff going on, it, it will be detrimental to to denning bears and to resting bears. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I definitely want to read more about it. And I need to look at a. I feel like it's there's like the Arctic Wildlife Refuge, which is where there's I'm like drawing a little map in my mind here. I feel like there's the Arctic Wildlife Refuge, which is where a lot of the polar bear den sites are. And then I feel like Willow is a little bit to the west of that, but I gotta, I gotta read up on it a bit more. Mm. Well, thanks for breaking that down. That's all we have time for today. So I'm gonna turn it back to you for closing comments. Uh, well, folks, thank you very much. Again, thank you, Natural Habitat Adventures. Thank you, Sunny. Um, it has been an absolute pleasure. I hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon. And I hope you ponder the umbrella bears of the world and, uh, and send out good vibes for them to uh, continue protecting the habitats in which they thrive. Thank you very much. Will do. Thanks again, Eddie. That was fabulous and, and just really thought provoking. I want to thank everybody who tuned in. Please join us again tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone.